Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Brain Scratch for today, Friday, July 21st, 2017. Hope you all had a great week. Hopefully you're kicking off into a fun weekend. I'm your host, John Lorden. And before we get started on today's case, I have to give a very big thank you to Christina Lewis, who suggested this case. Um, I have to say, looking into cases of unidentified bodies being found is extremely tough. Um, one of the things that I look for when I'm researching cases is the personal history of the person that I like to share that to kind of bring the humanity to all of you about, you know, this was a real life that that was ended. And here's the type of life they were trying to lead. Unfortunately, we can't do that in these cases. And that's why generally I will shy away from them unless there is some pretty compelling information um, like we had in terms of uh, the Tom and Should case. Uh, we had the interesting Neil Dovestone's case. So there's some theories around this case that I think are very much worth discussing. And of course, we're going to try to raise exposure to this case. There is contact information in the description box below if you think that you have some information that can help with this case. So with all that being said, let's take a look at the case of the lady in the dunes. And here is where the mystery starts. This is a gravestone. We can see it is for unidentified female body found Race Point Dunes, July 26th, 1974. Yes, this is a mystery that has gone on for over four decades at this point. Uh, here, this is a computer composite sketch based off her skull of what she may have looked like. Now with a case that has gone on this long, I can tell you there has been numerous composite sketches. If we jump over to the Doe Network here, um, you can see here is one that was recently put out by the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. And of course, when you compare that to the recent computer sketch that I had pulled up, um, you see that it's it's pretty different. It's pretty different looking, guys. I'm really kind of struggling with the variance that I'm seeing in these sketches. But when you have artistic interpretation that is a part of these sketches, I think this is kind of bound to happen. Uh, some of these sketches look like she could have possibly been of another ethnicity. Um, there are some features from some of the sketches to other parts of the sketches where you can see kind of similar things happening. I don't know if when people are doing recreations, if potentially they're looking at all the previous sketches and trying to incorporate that information. But um, here, this is at least the best collection I've been able to find of all the sketches in one place. And that is at the Doe Network. So you might want to check that out. Uh, also on this sketch, you might notice on the left side, um, they have her face kind of cleared up where on the right side they have added freckles. Um, I believe they're assuming that she could have been freckled because she had auburn hair, kind of reddish hair as it's depicted here as well. So let's learn a little bit about where she was discovered. Uh, Provincetown, Massachusetts. Provincetown is a New England town located at the extreme tip of Cape Cod in Massachusetts in the United States. A small coastal resort town with a year-round population of just under 3,000. But get this, Provincetown has a summer population of as high as 60,000 people. Apparently this place just gets jammed around uh, tourism times. Uh, the town is known for its beaches, its harbor, artists, tourist industry, and its status as a vacation destination for the LGBTQ community. Um, so when you have that many different people coming to this area, particularly to vacation, it's going to put some strain in terms of this investigation in two ways. First of all, identifying who she is. She might not be a person that necessarily lived in this area. She might have been vacationing there. And then number two, the person that ultimately murdered her could also be a vacationer and not uh, live in this area full time as well. On November 9th of 1620, the pilgrims aboard the Mayflower sighted Cape Cod while en route to the colony of Virginia. After two days of failed attempts to sail south against the strong winter seas, they returned to the safety of the harbor known today as Provincetown Harbor and set anchor. So this is literally where the Mayflower landed, obviously a very important piece of history for our country. 
All right, so let's learn a little bit about the Lady of the Dunes, also from Wikipedia. And here we see the Nikmik um, composite, which I'm still kind of baffled at how different that is from the other digital image. But uh, Lady of the Dunes is the nickname for an unidentified woman discovered on July 26, 1974, in the Race Point Dunes, Provincetown, Barnstable County, Massachusetts. Her body was exhumed in 1980, 2000, and 2013. In efforts to identify her and her murderer, to date, these efforts have been unsuccessful. Um, there's a lot of information in here, but we're pretty much going to be hitting it as we go through articles. So we will move away from the Wikipedia. Um, I did want to show you the area. Here is Race Point Beach. Um, you can see kind of how this tip juts out into Cape Cod Bay here. Uh, and she was found approximately two and a half miles to the east of Race Point Beach. Um, I'm just kind of eyeballing it here, but probably somewhere around here. If we zoom in on this area, you can see you've got nice sandy beaches. It pulls back from that. You get into some shrubs and behind the shrubs, you really start getting into uh, sand dunes. And it's among that area where she was found. Uh, let's take a look at an article from bostonglobe.com, but this article was actually written September 6th of 1987. So uh, I think this is a really good resource to get an idea on where the investigation was uh, 13 years after, but we'll hear some of the theories that are being kicked around at that point and get much more detail about what they found when they did find her. 13 years ago, a beagle sniffing around the dunes of Provincetown, its young owner nearby, made a gruesome discovery. The body of a young woman who had been brutally murdered. The body, badly decomposed, its skull crushed, the head severed at the neck, the hands cut off and missing, has never been identified, the killer never found. Um, obviously, when you hear that the hands have been cut off, you think that the assailant was trying to hide the identity of the victim. On top of that, he also tried to remove her teeth, but didn't remove all of them, only a few. Uh, some people speculate that he might have, and I should say he or she, but the, um, the culprit might have been interrupted in the act of removing the teeth and decided to flee the scene. And perhaps that's why they didn't finish uh, that job. Here in the picture, you can see that is actually her skull that is on the police chief's desk. And you can see um, just a few of the front top teeth are missing. Everything else looks pretty much complete. But of course, there is this gaping wound on the side of the skull. Uh, we'll talk about what might have made that in a little bit here. The first leads in several years have rekindled interest in the case, and Provincetown Police Chief James J. Meads is ready to tackle again a mystery he has always vowed he'd solve. Earlier this summer, a woman in her early 20s who lives in Canada told an acquaintance a bizarre tale. She said she remembered seeing her father strangle a woman in Provincetown about 15 years ago. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police were notified and they in turn called Meads and the Massachusetts State Police. In the meantime, the woman moved from Western Canada to the Montreal area and police are trying to track her down. I've seen several different um, mentions of this woman. I don't believe they ever did track her down. Um, there might be a good reason why they didn't try too hard to find her. We'll, we'll see that by the bottom of this article here. Then last week, a woman from Maryland called Meads to say that she had not heard from her sister since the sister moved to Boston in 1974, the year of the murder. She also said her sister had auburn hair, the same color as the murder victims. Meads told her to get dental charts of the missing woman and send them to him. Since the dead woman's face was crushed and decomposed and her hands and therefore fingerprints were missing and have never been found, dental records are the only way of identifying her. Now, keep in mind, this is an article written in 1987. Obviously, nowadays, we would look to DNA to make an identification like that. And that is part of the reason why her body has been exhumed numerous times uh, at this point. As for the tale of the woman in Canada... Meads is skeptical. From what I've been told, she saw her father strangle somebody. If that's true, then it's not our victim because she wasn't strangled. 
Now, I've seen some conflicting information about this. I've seen some information suggesting that she might have also been strangled, but the cause of death was clearly the blow to her head and that the blow to her head was caused by what appeared to be a military trench cutting tool. Uh, let's jump over to websleuths.com. I saw an interesting comment from Polywog about this type of tool. Trenching shovels are common here. It's a foldable shovel, easy to carry. They sell them at Marine Specialties, our local Army Navy store. Lots of people have them for beach campfires because we're required to cover the fire pit before we leave. Um, I also remember when I was a kid, my family had one of these shovels as well for when we would go camping, the exact same purpose. Um, they're really easy to take around because they're so small. I mean, the shaft of the shovel is only about this long and then the head of the shovel folds onto that. But when you click it out, um, you only have a few feet of shovel. But thinking of how it was weighted and there was a, um, a pretty serious sharp edge to the, the top of the shovel head. Um, thinking about using that as a weapon, I'm sure it would have provided a devastating blow. So that is what they believe is a murder weapon, though uh, the actual murder weapon has not been recovered. Meads was 41 years old and had been Provincetown's chief of police just four years when the body of the Lady in the Dunes was found in a dense grove of scrub pine trees about two and a half miles east of Race Point on July 26, 1974. The woman, estimated to be 25 to 30 years old, about 5 feet 8 in inches tall with a big boned athletic build, had been killed by a blow to the left side of her skull. Um, let me just say at this point that I've seen several profiles about this case and that age range has now moved to, she could be as young as 20, she could be as old as 40. It's a very, very wide age range. Also, I've seen the height change a little bit. I think they're estimating somewhere between five foot six to five foot eight. Um, but outside of that, all the other details seem to be fairly consistent. She was found nude, lying sideways on a light green terry cloth beach blanket. Her dungarees and blueprint bandana were folded neatly under her head as though used as a pillow. Her blouse never has been found. Um, because of the way that she was found and the lack of a struggle that it looked like at the scene, it leads them to pretty much believe one of two things. They think that either she was killed by someone that she knew very well and was very comfortable with, and it was just a very quick attack and there was no chance for a struggle, or potentially she was killed somewhere else and brought to this location. I'm not sure why there's such a debate about that because I would have to imagine that the actual scene in terms of how much blood was found at the scene would help them determine if she was killed there or not. You have to figure with that kind of wound in her head, if she was killed somewhere else and then brought there, um, the amount of blood that would have been left at the scene would probably have been a bit different. It probably would have been quite a bit lighter, um, but I have not found any analysis on that whatsoever. Her long reddish brown hair was held back with a beret on her teeth were seven gold crowns worth about $5,000 to $8,000 at the time. This is another very interesting fact. Um, obviously, she was either into some money herself, which I think this area is known as is a bit of a, of a high class area, um, or Potentially, maybe she was with someone that had paid for her dental work that was into some serious money, but you're talking five to $8,000 back in the 70s. That was significant. Um, I mean, you're, you're basically putting jewelry into your mouth at that point. So very, very interesting uh, tidbit here. Another thought on the fact that her hands had been removed is that potentially the person that did this to her thought that she might be identified, um, possibly because she had a criminal history. You know, that's one of the things I run into frequently on these cases I look into is that even if they get someone's fingerprints, it's not always 100% that they're going to be able to match that up because typically, at least here in America, um, we don't get fingerprinted unless we're being booked, unless we're in trouble for something. There are some programs that happened. I remember when I was a kid where um, they would be coming around to schools and they were trying to get kids to get fingerprinted so that they could be on record in case anything happened to us so we could be identified. But outside of small programs like that, Pretty much the main way that you get fingerprinted out here is if you're booked. So 
Was she potentially a criminal in her own right? Maybe that's why she had this type of money to spend on her dental work. Um, it sure seems like a possibility. And one of the theories that spins out of this definitely leans that way very hard. We'll, we'll get to that. Although pathologists said she had been dead only four or five days, the July heat and dune flies had left the body badly decomposed. Now, I find this interesting because this article is pretty tight about that time frame, but several of the other profiles I've read have a very wide time frame that goes from 10 days to three weeks. Quite honestly, I'm not sure what's more accurate, but um, to know that this was the expert opinion, at least back in the late 80s, um, I, I would want to lean on this as being a little more accurate. I don't know if maybe science has progressed and now they've done some new analysis. Um, I don't know. I don't know how they could have changed that that range so much, though, over the years. I'm just I'm not sure how that would have happened. But I wanted to note the discrepancy with you guys. Since there was no sign of a struggle and the bed of pine needles on which she lay was undisturbed, Meads believes she knew her assailant and was asleep when attacked. Um, and if you think about this scene, she's laying on a bed of pine needles. She's got her pants. Um, she's laying on a towel. She's got her pants and her bandana folded up kind of under her head, maybe like she's taking a nap. Um, I mean, it could, it could be that they had a date out there, essentially. Um, maybe did something that they were not supposed to do in public out there. Uh, and then after that, this person did this to her while she was sleeping. Um, or maybe she was out there sunbathing uh, without any clothes on. That's certainly a possibility as well. Uh, I'm, I'm really not sure. Thousands of dentists were contacted in an effort to locate the one who had done the expensive dental work. Meads appeared in national magazines and on network television. He has traveled extensively following leads. In the intervening years, Meads has received thousands of letters and phone calls. About 50 have been able to supply dental records, but none have matched. There have been seemingly promising leads. There was the man in prison in Maine who kept drawing pictures of women without hands. The women at Provincetown Campground who reported their friend missing, but she later turned up. With most murders, you try to figure out who the murderer was, he said quietly. I've spent years trying to figure out who the victim was. Meads had the body buried in St. Peter's Cemetery in Provincetown, and a stone there reads, unidentified female. Schwartz said that for years, somebody placed a small vase containing flowers at the marker every July 26th. Oh, I don't know, guys, we're in another tough case here. Um, one of the theories that spun out was about this woman. Her name is Rory Kessinger or Kessinger. Um, she is a convicted felon, was actually in jail and escaped jail. For a while, they thought this might be her. As you can see, if you look at her facial structure and at least some of those composites, uh, she does appear that she could be a match. Um, but that's one of the reasons why they did one of the exhumations. They got uh, a strong DNA profile from her. They eventually tracked down, I believe it's Rory's mother, uh, and they confirmed that it actually was not her. Um, here's an article or a comment from crimewatchers.net that clears it up for us. Um, investigators also followed a lead involving Rory Jean Kessinger, who would have been 25 years old during the murder, who had broken out of the town's jail in 1973. After the skull was reconstructed, authorities saw a resemblance between both Kessinger and the victim. This, this theory was later discarded as DNA from Kessinger's mother compared to that of Lady of the Dunes bone marrow did not match. So we've got a firm DNA does not match there. One of the theories that I think might be the most plausible has to do with this man. Uh, you might recognize him. There's been a few movies about him lately. His name is James Whitey Bulger. Uh, let's read this piece of an article from Ranker.com. In addition to cutting off her hands, someone removed several of the woman's teeth, causing people to speculate the Lady of the Dunes may have been killed by James Whitey Bulger. He was a notorious mobster involved with an organized crime syndicate in nearby Boston at the time. 
Uh, Bulger and other members of the Winter Hill Gang reportedly removed their victims' teeth after killing them to make it more difficult for the authorities to identify them. He was also known to frequent a popular gay bar in Provincetown, in Provincetown called the Crone and Anchor, close to where the lady was found. Um, I also heard on a podcast, which I'll have in the description box below, um, that potentially the beach, the um, beach towel that she was laying on might be from the crone and anchor. I tried to dig into that for myself. I could find no information to corroborate that, but I just want to let you guys know uh, what I heard in terms of researching this. Uh, outside of Whitey Bulger, we also have another theory here. A suspected serial killer confessed to murdering her. So we actually have a confession. While behind bars for murdering two people, Hayden Clark told a cellmate he killed the woman known as the Lady of the Dunes. The convicted murderer, a paranoid schizophrenic, told his fellow inmate that his alternate personality, a woman named Kristen, killed the Lady of the Dunes in 1974. Clark, who authorities believe is a serial killer, was a suspect in several other murders. Uh, he also showed investigators where he allegedly buried some of his victims. However, officials from Massachusetts searched the places in Cape Cod where Clark indicated he hid his victims' bodies, and they didn't find any evidence to support the killer's claims. While the authorities haven't ruled out Clark as the person responsible for murdering the Lady of the Dunes, the Provincetown police doubt he was involved in the unsolved killing. And you have a man that is struggling with a severe mental disorder here, being a paranoid schizophrenic. Um, very hard to know if this is a uh, reliable confession, but if he's proclaiming that he has information about where the bodies are and they go and they can't find the bodies, it gets very, very skeptical. One thing he did that is a little bit interesting is he drew two pictures. Apparently, one of the pictures was of a woman lying face down with her hands removed, and another of the pictures looked like a map, and apparently it, it pointed to the approximate area of where her body was actually located. So, there's kind of information on both sides of the fence here uh, in terms of his potential involvement there, but nothing very, very solid. And now we get to what is the most interesting of the theories. Uh, I don't know how strong it is, but let's take a look at it. Jaws, the film, just got even scarier with this spooky murder mystery connection. And here we see a screenshot from the film Jaws, a scene with a bunch of people, and we see the composite from Nickmec, and we see a woman being highlighted in the composite. So what do you guys think? Are you seeing a potential match there? Uh, she's also wearing a blue bandana. I can't tell if it has a print on it. Uh, the descriptions that I've read always seem to say that it was a printed bandana. So I'm thinking it's one of those bandanas that has the kind of traditional um, logo, print printed logos on it. But uh, I'm not sure. She's wearing jeans and a blue bandana, so there's at least some of a match. Take one famously unsolved murder mystery, one of the greatest horror films in history, and one of the best horror writers of the current generation. And you mix them all together and you get this summer's most chilling fan theory. Joe Hill is actually the son of author Stephen King. Joe Hill is an author himself, and he had a bit of an experience when he decided to go to an anniversary screening of Jaws and see it on the big screen. In June, Jaws was unleashed on theaters once more to celebrate its 40th anniversary. For the first time, I saw the picture the way it was meant to be seen on the big screen. Now, understand... I had only just finished reading The Skeleton Crew a few weeks before. The Lady of the Dunes is in many ways the centerpiece of that book. After finishing the book, I had spent a few minutes online acquainting myself with the latest details uh, and studying the recreation of the lady's, the lady's face. And now, suddenly, impossibly, there she was, life-size and looking over her shoulder at me, there for a moment in a busy crowd scene, and then gone. Blue bandana, about 30, fit, 145 pounds. I don't believe those are Wrangler jeans, but a lady presumably owns more than one pair of jeans, is the lady of the dunes in Jaws. Well, 
Uh, I don't know what you guys think. I think this is pretty thin. Uh, apparently some scenes were shot in the Cape Cod area and the timing of when those scenes were shot. Um, it could have been the same person, but keep in mind, we're talking about an area that usually has only 3000 people living there. And then during vacation time, it explodes to up to 60,000 people. Um, like I said, the, just based off those numbers alone, the likelihood that she actually lives in that area just statistically is very, very low. So is this someone that would have really been available to be an extra um, on Jaws and then you know, a number of months later, wind up the victim of this crime. I think it's a bit of a potential possibility, but keep in mind, he's doing a comparison to a composite that if you look at all the composites, they vary from each other pretty significantly. So in essence, he's found a woman in a film that looks like a picture that was drawn by someone that is a recreation of what they thought a person looked like based off their skull only. It is a very loose connection. I don't know if there's a whole lot to it. Um, in a podcast I listened to, he made a good point that, hey, you know, even if there is nothing to it, at least it raised exposure to the case. I certainly think there's something to that. And I have to say, uh, before this, I had no idea who Joe Hill was. I didn't even know that Stephen King had a son that was uh, also an author, particularly of horror fantasy. Um, so I don't know. I really don't know, guys. I don't put, I don't put as much into that as I do into the Whitey Bulger theory. Um, or quite honestly, even the theory about Hayden Clark, I think there's, there's more merit in those theories than there is in the Jaws sighting. Um, but that's just, that's just my personal opinion. You guys might feel much differently about that. Um, so the Boston Globe did get back to this case and wrote another article on it in July of 2014. That is a year after the last time that she was exhumed. Um, Police Chief Meade, I believe, is long since retired. There is now someone else that's working the case. For half a lifetime now, Provincetown detectives have ridden an investigatory roller coaster trying to solve this macabre riddle. They've consulted dentists and psychics. They've exhumed the body and extracted DNA samples. They've used ground penetrating radar. Quote, how does someone end up here of all places not to be identified for 40 years? The lead investigator, Provincetown Police Detective Meredith K. Lober said. To say the case is cold describes the results of the so far fruitless search, not its intensity. The latest DNA evidence was collected last summer and now forms the basis for the forensic scavenger hunt. She is convinced the killer will be found once and if the victim is known. The two were closely linked, investigators agree. But 40 years have passed now. If the killer was about the same age as the victim, he or she could be pushing 70. That window is closing and it's closing rapidly, Lober said. For now, she's trying to raise funds for a new coffin. After 40 years, the lady's thin metal casket is rusting out and falling apart. I really wish in this article that they would have told us how she's trying to raise funds. I would have absolutely donated to that. And I don't think it would be hard to kick up a GoFundMe and to, um, you know, kick that out in social media and raise funds to do this. Um, I, I just, it's, there's no information here and I can't find any inf information on how to do that. If you guys are lucky enough to know or to find information on that, um, please post it in the comments below for the rest of us. Hopefully they've got it done. I mean, this was written back in 2014. Maybe they've already got that problem solved and she is now in a new coffin. Um, but if not, you know, and one of you is able to find out, let's please get the word out on that because I would certainly like to contribute um, to that cause. Uh, it was interesting that at the end of this article, um, they're making it clear that the killer could be a man or a woman. And we're talking about an area that is known uh, as a vacation area, like we heard in the Wikipedia thing for LGBTQ. Um, so could it be that it was a woman that killed her? Could it be a friend that was with her? There's one detail I haven't told you guys about yet. 
It seems like her body was sexually assaulted after she had been killed, and it seems like it happened with an object made out of wood. Um, When I think about it, and I know this is a terrible thought, but um, that shovel, certainly one end of that would be wood. I don't know if it's, if it's been tested. I don't know if they can confirm if it is, if there are pieces of that shovel, uh, to be found there. But, um, that makes me think that there could have been a possibility. Maybe this could have been a lover of hers. Maybe there could have been a quarrel of some kind. Um, maybe this is someone that maybe they went on vacation together. There are so many different possibilities about how these two people are connected, but ultimately, we're really not going to get anywhere unless we're able to identify this person. So what I want to put out there is I want people maybe that are aware of this case, or um, maybe if you were in the area back at that time, um, maybe just put your brain on it. Just give it a little bit of thought and try to recall if there was anything strange where you knew of a group of two people and only one of them came back. Um, you know, maybe they said it was a girlfriend of mine and ah, we broke up and I'm just not going to see her again. There's some little missing piece out there that the authorities need to put this thing together. And it could be as simple as that. So if you were in the area, um, even out of the area, if you knew people that were traveling to the area, specifically to vacation, just put a little thought into that. I don't think it is a big chunk of information we're looking for that's going to crack this. I think it is something extremely fine and detailed. It's something really, really small, but someone out there has that missing piece and this case desperately, desperately needs it. Um, Now, in terms of how many murderers there were, in most of what I've seen here, it's alluding to the fact that it seems like there was one person with her. But I have also heard some other information that two sets of footprints were found. One of the footprints is specifically a size 10, a man size 10. And they said he seemed a bit heavy and that he was running. Once again, if we think of that situation where perhaps if he was trying to pull her teeth and he got scared, he heard something, thought someone was coming, he might have run and fled from the scene, that might explain those footprints. I haven't heard any details on the second set of prints. Could both of the footprints have been the two of them walking to the area and then only one person leaves? Or is it potentially that there's two sets of prints that are leaving from the area? I'm not sure. Um, apparently, they, they also did find some tire marks approximately 50 yards away from this area, um, but I've seen very little analysis on that outside of that. Uh, in the description box below, I will have links to all this stuff and other stuff that I didn't even cover here. I will also have links to the Doe Network um, page that I showed you with all the different uh, graphics and composites of her. And NamUs also has a record started on this. That is all down below. Contact information is down below. And this is where I turn it over to you, Brain Scratchers. Um, Let's talk about this in the comments. Please let me know if you have any other theories on this case. Um, It's really, really a heartbreaker. It is it's such a simple thing that we're looking for here. It is a name to put to this person um, to give her proper dignity in terms of her burial, but to also give authorities just a chance at solving this case. And do they already potentially have the person in jail? Uh, if YD Bulger is indeed the person, um, there's a chance of that. I did hear that his lawyer was questioned specifically about this case, and they have declined to comment it, to comment on it at all. So I'll just leave that with you guys. But thank you so much for joining me on today's Brain Scratch. I appreciate each and every one of you that watches out there. I hope you have a wonderful Friday and enjoy your weekend. I'll see you here on Monday on the Lord Marks channel.